All right. Hi there. My name is Chris Orban. I'm a professor at Ohio State University, and I'm here to talk about the most introductory content that is currently on the pickup site. I am the author of many of those activities, uh, one of which is right here. This is what I call Planetoids with Torque. And so it's kind of a riff on the classic Asteroids game. And before I get into all the nitty gritties of, of what's my motivation for doing all this and sort of the philosophy of, of what to do, um, this kind of in a nutshell uh, kind of gives you an idea of what I think is appropriate for an introductory course. So the student actually does some amount of coding to get this interactive to work. Uh, and so it's, it's fun, it's interactive. Um, it illustrates vectors. So if you look closely there, uh, you'll see there's a velocity vector, an acceleration vector, torque vector, things like that. Um, and so one hopes that one can build a kind of intuition about vectors and about force and torque and angular acceleration and things like that uh, from an activity like this. So before I get into all the deep nitty gritty details, this is the kind of combination of gameplay that I feel like we don't often see in computational physics. Um, and so that's, that's what I'll be, be talking about. Now my close collaborator on this project is Professor Rochelle Teeling Smith at the University of Mount Union in Alliance, Ohio. So I want to give a shout out to Rochelle before I get any further. Uh, and thank her for her help. Now I am passionate about introductory activities and uh, most of the students that we are going to educate are going to be in these introductory classes. I think these classes are overall a little bit boring. You know, whenever you tell people on the plane that you do physics, they always grunt and things like that. Um, so we have to kind of keep on reinventing it, these courses. Uh, and if we care about diversity, we should care about these courses. I mean, there's a lot of attrition that happens in these courses. And, uh, and so one of the things I'm going to argue is that uh, it's important to put coding in these courses so that students get a chance to do coding if this is the only chance that they can. And, and we have to reach those groups every chance that we get. Um, and just for me, why, why would you do coding in an intro course? It just seems like the right thing to do. There's just, that's what my gut tells me. Um, now, you know, there's different level, you know, introductory can mean a number of different things. And so some people say introductory, they say calculus-based physics, uh, or maybe they be, mean algebra-based physics. Um, my goal is to kind of focus on stuff that could fly in an algebra-based physics class. Um, and so the math level is algebra-based, uh, and one hopes that the difficulty level is also algebra-based. This is something we're trying to assess, so it's not just some assertion. Um, and by focusing on algebra base, that means that you can put these activities into a calculus-based physics class without, you know, really sweating that uh, it's, it's going to be too hard. Um, so so that's, that's my approach, and I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's not as much the approach of matter interactions, maybe that's more of a calculus-based curriculum, but uh, uh, maybe I can comment on that a little bit later. Now, I'm not the only author of introductory stuff on the pickup site. Um, and so one of the things I did is I, I got them to put the high school category there. Uh, and so a lot of my stuff is categorized as high school, primarily because there's not a whole lot of other places, there's not a central place to go to find high school level coding activities on uh, Compadre or APT at the moment. Um, and so if you search on high school, you'll very easily find uh, 13 of my activities. Um, there are some first year activities that are calculus based, things like that. Um, but there's other things. So, so if you go to the, the pickup workshop this summer, one of the first things they're going to talk about is Kelly, uh, who I know well. Kelly's going to talk about uh, a falling sphere with air resistance. I mean, that's kind of the classic compu initial computational problem where um, you know, a lot of people like to do spreadsheets. Uh, other people use, have a Python program to do it. Um, but that's kind of the go-to thing. And so that's what you'll see from Kelly. Uh, but if you look on the, the pickup site, you'll see a few other things. So Aaron Titus, who's, who's done a lot of physics and video game stuff, has a Lunar Lander game uh, that's actually in 3D. Um, there's a couple different things that are labeled as first year activities. And so I, I don't want to give the impression uh, that I'm the only game in town in terms of uh, these activities. And there's, maybe there's a few others up there now that I, I've, I've missed on this list. So, um, these are all calculus light. Now, the, the thing that, con that concerns me a little bit is that uh, 
some of the first year activities are animated, but relatively few of them are, are interactive. To my knowledge, the only interactive one, and by interactive I mean that the student is, is, is giving input to the program as the program is running. Uh, the, the only program that besides mine that does that is Lunar Lander. Um, all of my intro activities are animated. Uh, not all of them inter are interactive, but more than half of them are interactive, and especially the classical mechanics ones. Uh, so my title slide is, is a classic example of, of interactive code. Um, now, uh, so this is, so this is uh, kind of the full list of my activities, and I would say this takes roughly about half an hour to an hour for each one. Uh, the videos there are hi highlighting the, the asteroids with the spring, uh, which demonstrates harmonic motion, which I actually think is a really clever exercise because you don't force it to do a harmonic motion. You just put in the spring force and let nature do its thing, let the computer iterate. And then on the bottom here, which unfortunately is, is a little bit blocked by my laptop here, let me see if I can walk over here to let you guys see it. This is actually a particle getting deflected in a magnetic field um, like so. Uh, it's a bit smoother when you're not trying to record a video and show, <laughs> show videos of PowerPoint all at the same time. Um, but there's a whole bunch of activities that are there. Um, now, all of them have animations, as I said. Uh, perhaps most of them have some sort of interactivity, again, where the student is interacting with the program as it runs to produce some kind of interesting behavior. Uh, but importantly, uh, many of them have validation. So I don't have validation on the Asteroids with Torque thing that was on the title slide. Uh, but the other ones, so for example, Lunar Lander, um, you know, there it's, it's similar to the classic game where you try to land on the moon without crashing the ship, things like that. If you don't fire the thrusters at all, well then you just have some object that's free falling to the ground. That should take a certain number of seconds for it to go from this height to the ground. You know, you can do the standard one half AT squared calculation to see if that matches up. And again, the interesting thing is that the program isn't hardwired to do the one half AT squared. The program is designed to iteratively solve the accelerations and velocities and stuff like that. So the fact that it matches up with one half AT squared comes off as kind of a kind of a miracle. And I would say that this is quite important, and I, I'm sure everyone agrees with me. Uh, but you know, even if so, if you think about the students that we're teaching. You know, not all of them are going to grow up to be computational physicists or, you know, engineers that, that wake up every morning to, to code and improve some simulation. Uh, but a lot of engineers are going to be running these commercial simulations as part of, as a regular part of their work. And they need to have an understanding of how do you, how do you even go about validating these codes uh, and, and thinking about uh, how the computer never gives you exactly perfectly the right answer. Um, so my mom, this is, this is a true story, my mom is dating a NASA engineer because uh, she lives in Florida and she met, met him and so on and so forth. Um, but he complains about some of the engineering students that he, he gets because they have these programs to analyze structural mechanics and things like that. And they just assume that those programs are always going to give the right answer. And so this is a rocket ships that we're talking about with people on top of them in some cases. Uh, and those, every student needs to have an understanding of just how useful, but how precarious it is in some cases to, to use a computer to do important work. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is from my Hour of Code submission. Now I'm very proud of this because it is uh, essentially the first physics-focused Hour of Code submission. So if you go to hourofcode.com and you search on comfortable coding activities, you will, you will find my stuff there as the, the physics of video games. Um, so here's Hour of Code. Uh, you know, if about a year ago, six months to a year ago, uh, there was only three science exercises there. Um, now, if you go there now, you'll see a lot more, and I'm happy to see that. Uh, my activity is one of the new activities that's there, uh, and, and I believe it's the only uh, physics-focused ones. There's other projectile motion stuff there, but certainly the only one that's produced by a physics professor, I would say. And the premise of it is the physics of video games. And uh, as the Hour of Code activity talks about, you know, we can talk about Mario Kart, we can talk about all kinds of you know, more realistic racing games. And just to try to get the, the students thinking about what is the computer doing behind the scenes uh, 
you know, as this game is happening and how realistic or unrealistic is it? And just by thinking about that and thinking about the shortcuts that, that's sometimes taken, um, even the most realistic, the newest most realistic game is cutting corners in some way that if you look closely enough, you can catch it. And so we're trying to initiate a discussion to, to get students to think about uh, the video games that they play kind of critically. It is called Agario, um, and what you get to do is you're a little blob oh, eating food, trying to get bigger uh, so you can eat other Gario, blobs, and avoiding and other blobs. This is actually a very popular game. I was giving eaten. a talk uh, to right, so this the idea of this game is that you move around at basically a constant speed. Attendants and I ask them how many of, uh, how many just, of them had heard of this game and controlling Agario. it, and moving it around, things like. And it is called Agario, and what you get to do is you're a little blob well eating game. food, and trying so to get bigger so you can eat other blobs, let's take a well -known and avoiding game, other uh, blobs bigger than you so and that let's you make don't a coding get activity out of it. And so what I'm going to do, uh, just in front of you, I'm going to sort of walk you through what's involved here. So I'm actually going to go ahead and and click on this this code here, and hopefully that'll come up. So there we go. And uh, so there you go, the code just comes up. All you have to do is click a web link. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to put, set up a Jupyter notebook or anything like that. Um, the code here is, is uh, JavaScript. And usually when you use JavaScript, you're going to want to use some sort of code library uh, to, to, for some of the graphical functions. There's a couple different choices with that. I use uh, p5.js, which I think is one of the best, if not the best, graphical libraries for JavaScript. Um, and modern, modern browsers, you know, think and breathe JavaScript. So if, you, if you're using Visual Python, uh, Bruce Sherwood and uh, Ruth Shebe, they have, they have to work very hard so that the Python gets converted to JavaScript to be run in the browser. But if you just code and got JavaScript, it just, it's already in that format. And to me, JavaScript looks a lot like C or C++. Uh, you know, I grew up, you know, as a C programmer, so I'm showing my biases there. Uh, but it seems to be a pretty good job. Um, now, this is the whole code that we're going to work with. It's about 50 lines of code. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger there. Um, and so we have some variable declarations. We have this draw function that we're going to run over and over and over again. And, uh, and then we display some stuff, and then we draw this blob. Now, so if I go ahead and press play, now uh, something that's important to do is you really need to press, uh, you actually need to click the screen, otherwise nothing will happen. Uh, so if you click the screen, then you can hit the right arrow, and that will move the thing to the right. Uh, and if you're not trying to encode a video while you're doing this, uh, it's actually quite smooth, and it'll run at about 60 frames per second, so it has this nice vivid video game feel to it. Um, but it only moves to the right, and it does not move up, down, left, or right. And so uh, we've, that's, that's our task. Um, by the way, if you move it all the way to the right, it'll sort of wrap around there, which is kind of a fun thing. Here it goes. All right. So we got to stare at this code. Uh, again, this is our hour of code activity. We got to look at this code and just kind of try to diagnose what's happening here. Um, so there is a left arrow here. And it says, do nothing. And so maybe that's why when we press the left arrow over here, nothing happens. So let's, let's go ahead and stop the program real quick. Uh, that'll give, us, give my laptop less to think about. And I'm going to put VX. Uh, I know you guys are all over this in the audience, so pretty clear it has to be VX equals negative 10, so I can do that. And now it moves to the right, moves to the left. That's good. We can't move up or down yet. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. And I know this is all pedantic for you guys. I know that this is just sort of uh, in practically insulting to half of you in the audience watching this thing. Uh, but I think it's worth showing. Um, so now I've set the VY equals 10 if I hit up arrow. So I'll go ahead and do that. Again, i got to click the screen. Um, so to the right, to the left, up. I get an arrow. I can get a diagonal arrow if I want, if I hit up and left or up and right. By the way, Visual Python, you cannot press two buttons at the same time, so you can't move diagonally in Visual Python. Uh, so, you, so we tried to reproduce this in Visual Python, just it wouldn't work for that reason. So we're trying to move up. It's not moving up. So there's something that we're missing. So we got to look at the code and see if there's something else that's there. Um, again, this is all kind of 
it's almost self-explanatory uh, just to kind of go through this. So there's something missing in the code. If you look closely, you realize that, well, we're updating the location of x, but nowhere do we update the y location. And so I'll go ahead and do that. So y plus equals. Um, it should probably be vy, but just for fun, I'm going to put vx there and see what happens. Uh, and so now, huh, all right, well, I can move that. I'm going up or down. That's a little weird. Um, so just kind of by tinkering around, OK, well, that didn't work. Uh, just by tinkering around, you can kind of figure out what the things have to be. So all right, so now we have that. I'm going to move it left, right, up. All right, we're moving up. I can move diagonal. That's good. Uh, I haven't put the down arrow in there yet. Oh, wait, OK. Well, it moves up, but it doesn't stop. So it's supposed to stop when my hands are not touching the keyboard, right? So there's one more thing we're missing here. Um, and that is to set this equal to 0. Again, I know this is insulting to all of you in the audience, but there we go. So now it's up and I let go, it stops, okay? So that's move the blob. Now one of the cool things that you can do with move the blob, I'm gonna go ahead and stop that, is uh, once you kind of get it working, there's uh, a page you can go to, where you just click this button to copy uh, some code to the clipboard, and then you can kind of paste that into there and see the little path of the blob. So that's kind of fun, so like that. So that's good. And kind of the point of doing this is, is if, you, if you work through the Hour of Code example, um, the, the point of doing this is to say that, well, uh, if you look closely here, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting cold. If you look closely here, uh, you can go straight left and then all of a sudden go straight down. Is that really realistic? Of course not. You know, in real life, you don't have objects that go in one direction, then immediately turn on a dime and go another direction. Um, and so in, in that sense, this game is not very realistic. And so it would be nice to make it more realistic. And to make it more realistic, uh, we should accelerate the blob instead of uh, moving the blob. And so that's the next part. And uh, so I can kind of talk to you guys through these things. So this is accelerate the blob. And you can open up that code. And now the, the arrows thing I want to point uh, out here move, is that move uh, the arrows give the acceleration instead of the velocity. And so you can do the whole thing over again where initially the blob only moves to the right and you have to modify the code. Uh, and the main difference is that now, not only do you have to update the location, you have to update the velocity and things like that. Um, so at the end of the day, you get kind of this fun looking thing that kind of flies around. It has a little bit more interesting looking trajectories. Um, the other interesting thing is the faster you go, the further apart those dots are, which is another learning objective that we're supposed to communicate. So it fits very nicely in, in terms of uh, fits very nicely in terms of the objective. So by the way, this video behind me is from our, our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and search on STEM code and you can find that, that was fun with Accelerate the Blob. Yep, here's our YouTube channel. Um, so notice there's this little button here to subscribe. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, doing that, that would really, that, that way you'll get notifications about all the new videos. Now we've posted, since this picture was taken in, in January, we posted a bunch more. If you want the direct link to the YouTube channel, let's see if I can hide over here. So it's go.osu.edu slash stem tube is how to get to that there. Um, and please tell the outreach people at your institution that this resource exists. Um, and teachers, sometimes, uh, you know, this is, I feel like this is more for the teachers and the students. The other important thing to say about our, our YouTube channel is that if you look closely enough, uh, you'll notice that we have a high percentage of underrepresented groups on the YouTube channel, and I will tell you that that's not an accident. Um, so that's part of our philosophy in trying, trying to create these things. You know, I could probably go in the studio and make dozens of videos myself uh, and just knock it out, but you know, nobody really wants to hear me drone on and on. Uh, and I think you can speak from personal, I think you guys know from listening to me from personal experience, it's not the best thing. So uh, 
That's another, that's another important thing. And if you look on YouTube at this kind of STEM content that's there, it's very hard to find uh, underrepresented groups presenting STEM content. content. Uh, it's also hard to find, uh, you know, undergraduates presenting STEM content for high school students. High school students don't want to hear from professors. Uh, we have a monotone voice. Uh, we have weird mannerisms. Um, they want to hear it from uh, undergrads, you know, and everything about human psychology just reinforces that. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to have a high percentage of underrepresented groups, and I'm trying to stay behind the camera as much as I can, which I don't always succeed, but... There we go. Now assessment, um, uh, you know, we're thinking very hard about assessment and there's a couple things that you want to try to focus on in the assessment and I think something the pickup community needs to, to start thinking about is how can, we, how can we collaborate on assessments and to try to, as a community, figure out what's working, what's not. Um, now for this level, introductory level, you really want to know is, if this is an appropriate difficulty uh, relative to, for example, their math level or their prior physics level, things like that. Physicists are very good at making things that we think are at the right difficulty level that are actually quite above that. Um, are they having any fun? You know, because we design it to be fun, hopefully they do have fun. Um, so just go ahead and ask them. And uh, a big topic these days, sort of a hot topic, is computational thinking, which is something that even kindergarten classes are starting to, to think about. Um, are they learning any computational thinking? And uh, there's some people that are taking that question very seriously. Um, it's, this is not necessarily the top of my list in terms of what to, to assess. I'm more interested in are they gaining conceptual knowledge? Because I feel like uh, we have an obligation to try to to, you know, nobody's paying us to teach computer science. And so uh, we really need to be absolutely sure that these coding activities, which we think are cool and fun and clever, um, that, they're, that they're reinforcing the conceptual knowledge goals of that course. Um, and also I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. Um, so this is what I mean by conceptual learning. Now, uh, when we actually show this to students that's actually animated, and so you can see kind of a particle kind of come in. Uh, you know, there's a, this is a positively charged particle moving into an area with a magnetic field, and the student has to choose which one of these is correct. Um, and kind of the one that's on uh, the left kind of has this sort of weird kink to the trajectory once it leaves the magnetic field. Uh, the one that's on the right is actually still sort of accelerating once it leaves the magnetic field, but the one in the middle, uh, you know, kind of does does the correct circular trajectory and, and just moves straight in a straight line. Uh, Newton's first law there. So you kind of have to look at it and uh, this is the kind of question that I would hope that a student would be able to answer more accurately after going through the kind of coding activity uh, that I constructed. Um, this is another coding activity, little known fact. There is such a thing as an animated force concept inventory. So this was developed by Mil Mil Melissa Dancy who's a well-known physics education researcher, and I think she goes to most of the APT national conferences. Um, but this is, you know, originally this was a paper question about, that uh, had a diagram of a rocket uh, and its trajectory. And so they just went ahead and animated it. And so one of the things that uh, my team and I did at Ohio State is that we actually resurrected these animations because they were originally made in Java, and Java tends not to work on modern computers anymore. And so we got out an old computer and did screen captured and, and made it into MP4 videos. So we have these kinds of videos if you want to use it. I agree that it's not the most spectacular looking animation ever, uh, but Melissa did a good job of, of, of studying this assessment and, uh, it's, and it's, important to, it's important to whenever possible to use some assessment that's already been in play. Uh, and so, so that's one good reason to, to, to use this. And one hopes that you know after the students do my Asteroids game, maybe they'll be able to answer these questions uh, better. So that's kind of the hope. I don't necessarily have the hard data to back that up yet, but uh, that's one of the things that I'm shooting for with, with the assessments. Um, so the, the next thing I want to talk about after talking about assessment is that uh, this is a picture of what we call the, the STEM coding learning management system. 
and it is a learning management system that uses these JavaScript codes and this is what the the teacher view looks like so the students will fill out they'll, they'll do the coding activity in, in browser editor not unlike what you saw earlier uh, and then they'll click submit and when so when you go to, to check on your class you'll see a grid of all your students you'll see a grid of all your activities and you know things will kind of light up if they need if they need you to check it uh, and so the nice part is if you if you click on a student's submission you'll immediately see the code you'll be able to run the code just with the click of a button and that'll open up this screen here uh, so this is a, an asteroids game thing here and so you can play around with the code and sometimes it's a little sometimes it's hard to like glance at the code and be able to see if there's anything wrong with it you just gotta run the darn thing and so you can do that you look at it you say okay well looks good maybe you look at the student comments maybe the students are answering questions about the, the activity or something like that and then you can go ahead and grade the submission here and so there's no installation with this there's no you know downloads or anything like that um, you don't have to like download the folders and then look in the you know run run each thing um, so I, I find this it's not a perfect system it's getting better but uh, I find this to be as convenient as anything else um, and so people are welcome to use it uh, it's free for high schools uh, and it's it's right now it's free for colleges eventually we may we may charge a small much less than WebAssign fee for uh, using it so we can just keep the keep the site and keep it updated uh, but the long-term plan is to incorporate a lot of the conceptual questions into this site so that as soon as the student starts an activity they see these conceptual questions and can answer them uh, and then as soon as the student submits the activity they'll get these conceptual questions and we can try to chart whether there is an effect on conceptual knowledge uh, for the student um, so feel free to reach out to me and so what you can do is that if you register your email here and then you use the course join key capital CEU uh, you can see what it looks like from the student point of view and then you email me and I can give you teacher access and you can set up a course and things like that um, but please check it out now in in 2018 uh, we are gonna have some Google Hangouts with uh, high school teachers and things like that um, and so you guys are welcome to tap into those Google Hangouts and we'll just sort of chat about the exercises. Um, we're going to collect more assessment data from Ohio high schools and also OSU Marion and the University of Mount Union. And so we should have lots of good data uh, soon enough on that. And we are going to do a workshop at the summer 2018 AAPT. Um, and I mean, there's going to be a workshop with pickup, but that's going to be more oriented towards undergraduate physics. Uh, sort of like the major courses and things like that. Um, so we're not in competition with that, but if you'd like to focus on the, more of the introductory activities, um, feel free to come to our, our workshop at the summer 2018 APT in Washington, D.C. Feel free to register for that. So I'm going to be working on more coding videos. I'm excited about that. Uh, this is Demetrius and uh, Olivia from Ohio State. And uh, this is just kind of a slide of, of all of our contact. Um, we're now on Twitter. I forgot to put Twitter up there. But if you, if you find us on Twitter, uh, I am pretty addicted to Twitter these <laughs> days. It turns out to be a great way to get in touch with more physics people, actually. And, uh, and so I will post the, the kind of day-to-day -day comings and goings of the project and things I'm working on to Twitter. And so if you really want the up-to-the-minute stuff, you can find me there. We do have an email list uh, that I send an email out to about every month. Uh, you're welcome to sign up for that. We also have a website, um, things like that. Uh, so anyway, so here's, here's the information. And, uh, uh, and finally, I just want to thank Danny Caballero for uh, being willing to post this to uh, the YouTube page for the pickup site. So that was a, it was a very friendly gesture. So thanks a lot, Danny. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys uh, at a conference sometime soon. Thanks.